the main border crossings. You see the stream of refugees that are just passing before us, and they, the first thing that they see when they cross into to Poland um, is this tent with the Israeli flag um, as represented by the work that we support. The work that That's Adam Minsky. He heads Toronto's Jewish Federation, and he's standing in front of an army tent on the Polish-Ukrainian border. Minsky traveled to the region with Linda Frum. She's chair of the Federation. They just got back. They were the only Canadians to go on a trip put together by the Jewish Federations of North America to see firsthand where the millions of dollars that Canadian Jews are donating to help the Ukraine Emergency Relief Fund are actually being put to work and what else Canadian Jews should be doing right now. We immediately said we want to be very careful that this does not feel like, you know, crisis tourism. The reason why we went, yes, it was to show solidarity. Yes, it was to understand what the work we were supporting was doing and the scale of what was happening. But most importantly, it was about um, making sure that we would come back to be able to mobilize others to understand the magnitude of what's uh, happening. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Monday, March the 21st, 2022. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Linda Frum and Adam Minsky are the second group of high-profile Jewish Canadian leaders to fly to Poland to see the humanitarian crisis. You remember that several rabbis from Montreal went about a week earlier. In that short time, the scale of the migration crisis has exploded. The UN now says 10 million Ukrainians have left their homes because of the war. That's a quarter of the whole country's population. Canadian Jewish Federation money is going mainly to help the work of two groups on the ground, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and the Jewish Agency for Israel. Coming up, Minsky and Frum will be here to share what they saw and why, surprisingly, they don't expect that many Ukrainian refugees to come here. But first, here's what's making news elsewhere in Canada right now. I'm Elena Agatov in Winnipeg, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like. Jews continued to be a top target of hate crimes during the pandemic in Canada. A new report by Statistics Canada says in 2020, there were 321 hate crimes against Jews reported to police. And that's up slightly from the year before by about 15 cases. The results are troubling on their own, but also in a wider context because Jews remain the target of 13% of all the 2,000 or so hate crimes reported to police. They're second only to crimes against black people, which was 26 percent or double what Jews faced. The report says overall hate crimes and crimes based on ethnicity and religion spiked by 80 percent during the first year of the pandemic. And blacks and Jews and Asians bore the brunt of that hatred. And Linda Frum and Adam Minsky join me now fresh off the airplane in Toronto. First impressions now that you're back in in Canada. Start with Adam and then Linda. Yeah, I, the the most um, powerful thing for me was just how overwhelming uh, the the crisis is. Uh, it was far bigger in scope and breadth than anything I could have imagined before going. Just just to give you some context of of what we we saw, um, we were in Poland on days eighteen, nineteen, twenty of the crisis. Um, in, in 18 days, there were already 2 million refugees from the Ukraine in Poland and another million in the surrounding countries of Moldova, Romania, and, and Hungary. And, and what Linda and I witnessed at the border, those numbers are, are growing by the minute. Yeah, and I find when I think back on the days that we just spent, uh, what's staying with me and what's having a bit of a delayed, I'm having a delayed reaction on it is just the the palpable trauma that everybody that we met um, is experiencing uh, but it is it's really a, a kind of a PTSD where it is it's under the surface you see you feel it but it's it's subliminal and we all spoke about the how quiet it was at the actual border crossing where we were seeing thousands of people and you would think there would be a scene of chaos and you know noise and babies crying and and it was, it wasn't, it was, it was not silent, but it was super quiet. And, and, and then that's the, the thing that's staying with me and really still breaks me up is just knowing that people are carrying this intense trauma with them. 
Let's walk back a bit from the, the top of your head impressions to why you decided to go. Toronto is the third largest federation in North America. So in that context, uh, we represented our, our community, both to, to show solidarity, um, but, but even more significantly, uh, we've already, as, as Toronto raised $3 million, um, as a system granted $25 million to our partners who are doing incredible work on the ground, um, and we wanted to be there to see it and to understand. Tell me a bit about the day by days. Let's sort of walk us through generally what you did. We arrived uh, on Monday um, and uh, immediately uh, to get a sense of, of, of what was happening, um, we, we walked across the street from our hotel to the train station in Warsaw. Um, and if you ever needed an introduction to um, what was happening, uh, that that was as good a place as any to to understand the the train station in Warsaw um, is just uh, flooded with refugees disembarking from trains coming from different border locations. Um, all around the the train station are um, tables set up by um, everything from telecom companies giving out free SIM cards to the refugees so that they can call um, their husbands, brothers, fathers who are in the Ukraine because the Polish phone system is different than the Ukrainian one, to food relief, to um, toys for kids. The, the upper floor um, is just a, a mass of women and children uh, who frankly all just look like they're in shock as you would expect not really knowing what their next move is. Um, and I, kids are playing on the floor. Before our dinner, we were taken to, I, I think I can say the location. Yeah. Yeah, to the Novotel Hotel, just like right downtown in Warsaw, where the Israelis have taken over effectively like a conference room and it is, is, it is Israeli territory. There's a, a consulate general there and that is where they are issuing uh, passports to uh, refugees who can show they have, are of Jewish heritage. And uh, we saw them creating the passports like in real time on site um, almost instantly. And that was so impressive. Um, this was the base of the Jewish agency in uh, Warsaw taken over temporarily and, and with the Israeli consular officials there so that people are able to be moved very, very quickly to safety. What can we expect here in Canada? Numbers, when, are, there, are, there, are they on their way? What do you guys know? Um, I think the realistic fact here is, is that the Ukrainians want to stay close to home, that people are not, uh, people who are going to immigrate are not currently immigrating as, as intact families, that, that, that you have women and children uh, and elderly men uh, outside of the country, and then the men are all still in Ukraine, and um, and that's that uh, situation is going to persist. And so, uh, people making a decision to move to Canada with that leaving behind, you know, sons and fathers and, and husbands, I just don't think that that's going to happen en masse. We've been seeing a lot of you know injured children, dead children, hospitals. What do you see about that? What we did hear and what we did see, for sure, is the the psychological injuries and. What we heard is that, uh, and this is for any listener, uh, this might apply, that the greatest uh, volunteer need that they have is for people who have psychological training who can speak Russian, because there's just going to be an infinite need for psychological services that, that currently is not being met and will only grow. Uh, we did hear about one woman, who, Adam Wright from the Toronto community, who, is, who fits that description. She, she's a psychologist who speaks Russian. Uh, and she's Jewish and she's heading to Lublin, right? or I don't know where they're going to put her, but no, she's, she's actually in Budapest right now working okay. um, there. I, and, and I'm proud to say uh, through, you know, one of the things we've invested in as uh, a Jewish community as UJA um, has been the development of uh, Russian speaking Jewish leaders. Um, and through uh, that program, we have a group of, of medical and both psychologists and other medical professionals who are going to be going um, to the region. Did you guys bring personally anything with you? 
Um, yes, we did. Although I had a completely, I had one of those sort of inadequate Canadian moments when you pull out your bag and then you see the Americans pull out their bags and they're, they're 10 times bigger. But we did just arrange a huge transport right out of uh, from yeah. that point to go over uh, a cargo plane. So we, we wait, wait, tell me more about that before you. Yeah, before so we, we have a few things right now. UJ's Genesis program, which is our, our community mobilization arm, um, is collecting all kinds of goods that are going over to, to the Ukraine. In addition to what Linda brought, I also brought letters from Jewish day school students that I started delivering um, at the, the Hillel, I, which um, it was really amazing to see the impact of a, a child reading uh, the letter from a, a child here who, who was just reaching out to say that, you know, someone in Toronto is thinking about them and cares and uh, it, it really made a, a powerful impact. We, we also were at the um, Great Yeshiva in uh, Lublin um, and uh, the, the goods that us and other federations are sending over were just stacked um, in this transit. I mean, it's been, it was a, a hotel now that has been turned into a transit center for um, hundreds of, of refugees and the the rooms filled with diapers um, and and clothes. Uh, it, it's very um, it's very powerful to to see, and also gives you a sense of the overwhelming uh, needs. Yeah, that that was a, a very that was a very emotional thing to see, where the the supplies, in fact, currently in that in that location, were outstripping the demand, and and I, that's sort of heartbreaking too, just to see that the this is just this mountain of uh, goodwill that's expressed in in diapers and clothing and teddy bears and it's just love it's just it's just a representation of love what what more are you going to be doing you know um what isn't being reported uh ellen is that um at the same time that all of this is transpiring one of the things we saw um if you need help this is the the number to to call and that connects people to um, a hotline in uh, Jerusalem where um, people receive the, the support uh, by phone that they need and they're connected to know that, you know, if you want to go to Israel, um, the Warsaw Novotel has the um, Jewish Agency Center. And if you need uh, the uh, Lublin Yeshiva where the JDC has its set up, that, that's where you go. But an equal number of calls um, uh, are coming from Russian Jews um, and uh, what is truly remarkable um, is there is this a quiet story right now where the Jews of Russia, um, who are uh, much more significant in numbers than the Jews of the Ukraine, um, are uh, terrified um, and are looking to, uh, to go to safety. They are terrified that the Iron Curtain is going to fall again. Um, and they uh, have been devastated economically. Uh, the ruble is uh, has plummeted. Um, they're not able to communicate with um, friends and family for fear of reprisals. That if there are emails or anything um, that um, talk about them leaving, um, and so th this crisis, which is already overwhelming in the uh, in the Ukrainian context. Um, for us as, as Jewish leaders um, and Jewish communities around Canada, we have to know that the scale of this is going to broaden far beyond what's going on in the Ukraine. Um, and it's our responsibility to rise to the, the occasion. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality and customer care. Today's listener shout out goes to Alan Levine of Winnipeg. The award winning author and historian wrote to us very concerned about the new book about who betrayed Anne Frank, and we've been covering it extensively here on the CJN Daily. Levine says there are serious errors in the book, and we'll have more on this later in the week once a new study comes out on the book from Amsterdam. And we'll end the show today with a sneak peek at an upcoming interview. It's with a Ukrainian woman who has just arrived safely in Winnipeg after a harrowing escape from the city where that nuclear power plant came under attack by the Russians. She's now getting help from the Jewish Federation of Winnipeg. You know, she's on the platform for six hours. They were only allowing women with children.
So wherever there was a child and a mother, they were brought on board, but individuals like herself were not allowed and they were pushed away. She said she was beaten. She was pulled by her hair to, to pull her back um, so that she wouldn't get on the train. And she said, it's just a miracle that she's that she pushed her way through and got on a train. <laughs>